For the rest of the summer, we are hosting this sermon series on Psalm 23. We have this beautiful Psalm 23 window right as you leave the transept on the right. Um, and so today we are looking at, uh, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And each verse of Psalm 23, we'll take one at a time, and we're pairing each verse with a poem from a book that was just published of uh, recent poems, uh, many of which were written um, during the pandemic, that is called How to Love the World. And Krista, Krista Tippett um, reminds us that poetry can train our gaze to see the wonderful alongside the terrible, to attend to and mediate, meditate on what you love, even in the midst of difficult realities. And so um, we're taking this summer season to uh, dig into poetry a little bit more and to remember the ways that the voices today help us also um, give voice to the ancient sacred God who was with us um, back into the days of Psalm 23. So our poem for today is called Red Time by Laura Ann Reed. In the red time that crawls languidly between stepping stones, time stops as bees thrust their passions deep into the promise of tiny crimson purple blooms. Where blossom ends and bee begins are the first words of a lullaby, a lullaby the world sings while it rocks you. As you fall awake in the later years of a life spent mostly sound asleep. And we've already heard Psalm 23 sung this morning, but here it is again in this 2007 translation by scholar Robert Alter, whose um, kind of sense of the rhythm and poetry of the psalm kind of awakens us in a new way as we hear it alongside the familiar text that we know and love. He says that the Hebrew can be um, shared in English in this way. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In grassy meadows, the Lord makes me lie down. By still waters guides me. My life the Lord brings back, leading me on pathways of justice for the Lord's namesake. Though I walk in the veil of death's shadow, I fear no harm, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, it is they that console me. You set out a table before me in the faces of my foes. You moisten my head with oil. My cup overflows. Let but goodness and pure kindness pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for many long days. Please pray with me. Holy God, shepherd and Lord, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Something happens to me when I hear Psalm 23, that grassy meadow, that quiet stream. My mind understands this visual image. I've been there, right? You've been to this meadow, this stream. We know this place. It's a place of great comfort. Our bodies can relax just hearing those first words, the Lord is my shepherd. We know what comes next, and so we can just rest in the promise of God. The table is set, all is made ready. That possibility of flourishing draws near. No one has to wait in line. No one's need is met with scarcity in Psalm 23. The green pasture and still waters of Psalm 23 feed the youngest and the oldest equally, right? The lamb and the sheep, the smallest sheep, the largest sheep, the strongest, the weakest. Nobody has to fight over uh, the last piece of pizza. There is enough in this world that the psalmist builds for us in Psalm 23. No one's spot in the grassy meadow is better than someone else's. It's all green pastures and still waters. 
Now, if you've been to Abiquiu, New Mexico, to that sacred place where Georgia O'Keeffe painted her sparse abstract desert landscapes, you will find yourself adjacent to the Rio Chama, snaking across the terrain. All else is scrub brush and stone, but right there up against the river is a complement of vibrant green and fragile yet sturdy growth, an ecosystem that reminds you that water is life. Cottonwoods, willows, box elders, hackberry trees, they send their roots deep down into the river's edge so that when those sudden high desert rains or the winter mountain snow melt comes flooding down, they don't get uprooted. Or when the dry days come, they can drink the river's nourishment in times of drought. Any number of animals make their way to the water's edge, especially at dawn and dusk, elk, black bear, bobcat, coyote, as well as the local farmer's livestock. Many thousands of years ago, the scientists think it would have been North American woolly mammoths meandering down to the Rio Chama to drink water. But it wasn't until the 1600s that colonists, the Franciscan friars actually, added sheep to this river habitat. So there's something about this Rio Chama that made me look again at this image in Psalm 23. It wasn't until I looked at Psalm 23 verse by verse that I would have even thought that this shepherd's grand gesture of providing a grassy meadow and a quiet stream was anything but just a simple act of generosity. I typically envision an idyllic scene, a storybook picture with a babbling brook, and sheep kind of lazily grazing. It's easy to forget how much labor is involved in creating that safe environment at the waterfront where the other animals might appear, the predators, right, themselves in search of water, coyotes, bobcats, black bears. Can you imagine being a shepherd trying to defend your sheep in that context? The early morning um, would be tr steaming or teeming with wildlife that a shepherd would have to contend with. Imagine trying to ward off a black bear. Even before dawn, a hypervigilant lookout has to be awake to protect the flock. So maybe that's why when you go down the Rio Chama, there's this little uh, Trappist monastery called Christ in the Desert right there adjacent to the river Maybe that's why they get up at 3.15 to pray the psalms together. They know that our shepherd God is there already, awake before dawn. The good shepherd first has to create this context of safety for the sheep. Without that, the sheep cannot lay down in green pastures. It takes a certain kind of vigilance, maybe a sheepfold, right, some construction, takes years of experience gardening a flock and that intimacy of the sheep knowing the shepherd's voice. It takes relationship, a back and forth. We can't get to those green pastures and that still water without the shepherd. And then there's that expectation of green pastures. In the first place, in the ancient Near East, there were no well-manicured lawns with sophisticated underground lawn irrigation systems. There was no well-timed sprinkler. There were no fleets of semi-trucks to move your flock of sheep from this grassy meadow to the next. There was no Wi-Fi-enabled surveillance system to know when the pasture was just green enough to send your sheep over the hill. Green pastures were not a given. They're really not a given today either. A friend said her son drove to the West Coast this week and hit a wall of smoke somewhere between here and the Rocky Mountains where our country's fires burn. There can be no promise of green pasture. So green pastures were not a given. If your shepherd is leading you to lay down in those green pastures, then your shepherd has to be socially and relationally adept at well as well, right? Seeking access to land, 
grazing rights and safe entrance to the land so the flock can graze. So, and that can only happen, right? The shepherd can only bring the sheep to the green pastures if we're not in the middle of a drought or in the middle of a flood. Uh, Is there even a green pasture nearby? And third, so first you need safety, then you need green pastures, then you need still waters. Like New Mexico's Rio Chamo with its bank of deep-rooted trees, the ancient Near Eastern waterways may be at any given moment in a season of drought or flood. In drought, the rivers run dry. Flash flooding can just as easily trouble the waters. We know all too well after July brought flooding events of historic magnitude to Germany and China. Germany saw two months of rain in just two days, and China saw this deluge flooding the railway tunnels and torrents of water overtaking the streets. The riverbanks burst with an entire year of water falling in just three days. So I admit, in the past, I've overlooked this second verse of Psalm 23. I've overlooked the amount of work it takes to find both green pastures and still waters and provide enough safety for the sheep to eat and drink and rest. From this vantage point today, it seems like a miracle. Well, the very fact that the grass in my own front yard is still alive after this late spring drought that we had is itself a miracle. But most days, I just walk on by that green grass Same too for this verse of Psalm 23. I walk on by. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. It just slips away. It's too familiar or utopian or cliches. I just walk on by. So let's notice. Let us be people who notice. Let us be awakened by this work of looking at just one verse of a familiar passage. Let us notice the miracle of this green pasture and its quiet water. It might be a commonplace miracle. It might be an ordinary miracle, one ordinary miracle out of many. But even still, green pastures and still waters are offered as part of Psalm 23's narrative of provision set along that sacred mystery of God in shepherd garb. So this is no accident or twist of fate. Something happened here so that there would be fields of grass and river rations enough for all. From the perspective of the sheep, from their meadows, from their green pastures, I wonder if the sheep ask the same questions as the poets. Like poet Laura Foley, she asks, what luck or fate or instinct or grace brought me here? In shade beneath hidden stars, the soft summer morning, seeing with my whole being love made visible. Sometimes we walk on by love made visible. Let us notice it today. Can sheep live in the moment, appreciate the abundance of pasture and stream, or does it pass them by too? Does their capacity to notice the good day or the good hour diminish as those good days or good hours stack up one after another? How do we keep alert to the reality of our grassy meadows and quiet waters? How do we stay awake to the gift of this day and this moment? All we have is now. Poet R.S. Thomas puts it this way, life is not hurrying on to a receding future nor hankering after imagined pasts. Life is turning aside like Moses to the miracle of the burning bush, to a brightness that seemed as transitory as your youth once, but is the eternity that awaits you. In his essay reflection about the kingdom at hand from this sermon series poetry collection, How to Love the World, Ross Gay says that the gate to the kingdom at hand The gate to the kingdom at hand remains open any time we choose to pass through. In other words, that effervescent now, this moment today, the only moment we truly have, can always be unpacked, opened, met, seen. 
the ground beneath your feet recognized as sacred, the breath in your body rising and falling, the heartbeat within you perceived again, the thoughts in your mind quieted, the worries seen and handed over to the shepherd. When the rain comes, the flooding, when the drought comes, or the day comes to some unexpected close, when the thing that felt like it would go on and on forever ends, can we still, like poet E.E. E. Cummings, say, around me surges a miracle, around me surges a miracle of unceasing birth and glory and death and resurrection. Around me surges a miracle. One way to love the world again is to see it, to notice it, to be open to it, to praise God for it, to be alive to it. Even when the green pastures and still waters are fleeting, just one passing moment between that valley of the shadow of death and the next. Noticing the green pastures and still waters does not mean there will be no valley. It does not mean there will be no shadow. It does not mean there will be no death. But in the noticing, we have a chance to remake the world and reframe and become anew who we are meant to be in this life and to rest, to lay down in those green pastures that God provides for us. So maybe poet Julia Fehrenbacher is right when she says the truth is if we slowed down and got close enough, we wouldn't be able to handle the beauty. Maybe if we slowed down and got close enough, we wouldn't be able to handle the beauty. But if you slow down today and get close enough to that unbearable beauty of this life, Where will you see green pastures and still waters? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen.